Welcome, I'm Linda Teener, the Executive Director at UFM Community Learning Center. We're very pleased to host this lecture tonight with the assistance of the Kansas Wildlife Federation. Our series is named after Professor Lewis Douglas, a distinguished professor of political science at Kansas State University from 1949 until 1977. He was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to instigate change. With principle and humor, Lou Douglas motivated grassroots organizations and individuals to pursue social justice in political science, economics, and foreign policy. He was respected for his scholarly approach, but he was loved even by those who opposed what he was thinking about and disagreed with his positions for the graciousness and the camaraderie with which he reached out to both sides on an issue. He represented the highest standards of public morality and elicited our best impulses as citizens to strengthen democracy. It's in that spirit that we present the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. We try to bring speakers who are stimulating, thought-provoking, and promote discussion among the students, faculty, staff, and citizens of Manhattan and K-State. I hope tonight's lecture will continue in that vein. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Spencer Toom, Associate Professor of Biology at K-State, who's going to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, have a good time. Um, I also want to let you know that following the lecture, we will have a short question and answer period. Uh, if you need to leave, do so quickly and quietly, but I really encourage you to stay because it's often during the question and answer period that we get a good opportunity to interact and get questions answered. Uh, with the speaker that's here, and it's a unique opportunity that the Lou Douglas series offers is to allow those who are at the lecture to interact with the speaker. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Spencer Toon, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Linda. It's a distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. I've known him for over 20 years because of my association with the Kansas Wildlife Federation. He is a native of Pennsylvania and worked in conservation throughout his career. For the state government, uh, he was involved with uh, the legislature as an environmental uh, uh, leader. He worked for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, for a number of years. He worked his, uh, it first came to the Washington area to work for the National Wildlife Federation and worked there for 19 years. Um, and then he went to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and then after that to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Uh, almost three years ago, uh, he took on the job as, as president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, our nation's largest member-based, broad-based conservation organization. He has presided over the National Wildlife Federation as it uh, adopted a new strategic plan and has also fostered a climate of shared responsibility among the staff that has made us move in very good ways toward uh, the, the things that we need to do. He has focused our energies on connecting people with nature, ensuring places for wildlife in our country, and also in confronting global warming. Our speaker has been a diligent and passionate conservationist throughout his career. My favorite story about him is when he was with uh, his family in Oregon. And they were looking at a clear cut. And uh, he had a nine-year-old daughter with him at that time. And they had been there before. And she came up with tears in her eyes. And she said, why did you let them do this, Daddy? Out of the mouths of babes. We hope that we can say later that we stopped some of those things. Uh, but uh, anyway. Our speaker is Larry Schweiger, President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, and the title of his talk is Global Warming, Good Planets Are Hard to Find. Please help me in welcoming him to Manhattan, Kansas, and to Kansas State University. Thank you. It's great to be here and to be with my dear friend Spencer Toome. Uh, Spencer has been active uh, for uh, more than 20 years with the Kansas Wildlife uh, Federation. He's also central vice chair of the National Wildlife Federation, so he's my boss in addition 
uh, to being a professor here at the school. So uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to come here tonight. It's also um, interesting to me to come talk on a cold night uh, about a very hot topic in America. Some of you uh, may have uh, heard uh, of the recent report of the IPCC, uh, which was actually the fourth report that they've issued. Um, there's not been a lot of description about this organization, but it is an organization of some 2,500 climatologists from over 100 nations coming together to pool the most comprehensive science uh, available, over 10,000 studies together on this issue of global warming. Uh, and I would suggest to you that it's the most well-documented environmental disasters in the history of the planet. Uh, so we, we now know a whole lot more about the issue, and I'd like to talk a little bit with you uh, this evening about that. The title is Good Planets Are Hard to Find. Uh, this planet of ours is uh, clearly uh, had, um, had better care in its past. Um, one of the, there, there are two myths that I'd like to address about global warming. One is that we cannot possibly interfere with the way the climate works because we're so small and the sky is so big. If you would take a, a basketball and put a layer of paint on it, the atmosphere on the planet is about the thickness of that paint in relationship to the planet itself. So we're talking about a relatively thin system. We have been able over the last 150 years to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by 36%. So we are having a, a dramatic influence. The other myth that you'll hear if you listen to Rush Limbaugh or some of these other crazies is that humans, is that humans uh, aren't big enough to have an impact on the planet. Well, this uh, image has been put together by the U.S. Air Force, and you'll see the sky uh, as it appears from a satellite. Uh, notice the uh, white in the eastern United States. It breaks about here in Kansas, and you'll see the public lands in the west do indeed keep uh, uh, the night skies darker. Uh, look at Europe and Asia, but I would also draw your attention to Africa. Africa's drying out, and it's burning. And you see it from the night sky. You also see South America. And look at the Amazon. Around the edges of the Amazon are burning. Uh, I would also draw your attention to the yellow. That is uh, the flaring of the gas wells in Siberia. And the blue is the lights from the fisheries, uh, the, the, the Japanese trawlers uh, in the Pacific uh, and Japanese Sea. We are indeed adding more carbon dioxide to the planet each year. There was a time when we were adding one part per million per year. Uh, last year, we added 2.6 parts per million per year. So the amount of carbon dioxide that we're adding to the planet uh, increases each year. Here's the last 100 years of temperature. Uh, you'll notice that there's been an upswing. This is the, uh, the long debated hockey stick, uh, not debated among scientists, but among politicians. Uh, notice that the temperature tracks uh, carbon dioxide emissions. I should also mention as I'm talking about Washington, you know, you've heard of separation of church and state. In Washington today, we have separation of science and state. Uh, we don't uh, worry too much about science uh, as, as we once did, and in fact, uh, there's, there's a sense that we can edit out scientific documents, and you may have seen some of that on the C-SPAN last week. The problem we have is that carbon dioxide is a heat-trapping gas. We've known that it's been a heat-trapping gas since about 1850. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of new research on, on how, how it behaves in the environment, uh, but it's very well documented. The more carbon dioxide you put into the atmosphere, the more infrared you trap, and the warmer the planet gets. Scientists have now, through the drilling of ice, have documented the patterns of, of climate over the uh, over a 600,000 year period, and you'll notice that the temperature goes up and down. Uh, I should point out that the difference between this line right there and that line right there is almost two miles of ice over parts of Kansas. So the difference between that top of that white line and the bottom of that white line is about 100 parts per million in the atmosphere, and that's the difference between the temperatures that we've enjoyed and uh, an, a, a glacial period. 
We are seeing today uh, a very substantial increase in carbon dioxide. And in fact, we've set uh, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere not seen for at least a million years or maybe longer. Uh, we, we're seeing uh, carbon dioxide increase, as I said, uh, by 36 percent. Uh, it went from 281 pre-industrial revolution to about 381 parts per million uh, today. Now here is the most troubling part of this, of this graph, or this chart. In about 45 years, this is where we're going to be. And this is not deb debated among any scientist that's been involved with the IPCC. If we continue with business as usual, we are going to achieve that level of carbon dioxide, unprecedented levels. And in fact, if we go over 450 parts per million, uh, all bets are off as to the health and future of the planet in terms of human uh, uh, benefits. Um, we are headed very quickly to a point where uh, we're coming to a point of no return where nature itself actually begins to take over. Now what's going to fuel this, this rapid increase? And I should tell you that we've emitted over a trillion tons of carbon dioxide through our automobiles, through our power plants, and through our various uh, energy consuming uh, activities. And over the next 30 years, we're going to emit another uh, trillion tons of carbon dioxide. So over the next 30 years, we're going to double the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that humans have emitted uh, if we don't change our behavior. Uh, right now, the Chinese are building one new coal-fired power plant every week, and it's not new technology. They're using technology from the 1930s, using pulverized coal. Uh, here in the United States, there's proposals for building 150 new coal-fired power plants using old technology. Uh, the, uh, the nation of India is now trying to electrify over 300 million people who currently don't have electricity. And when they get their electricity, and this something changes, they're going to get it through the use of coal. Uh, so we see a tremendous increase uh, in coal usage around the world as a means to generate electricity, unless we change what we're doing. Uh, here are the combined air and sea surface temperatures from 1861 to 2004. And you'll know 2005 is higher than the rest. I would also add the 2006 numbers are not in yet, so we can't say with any certainty, but it looks like 2006 will be another record year. The, the time between July 2005 and June 2006 was the warmest on record for the, for the uh, contiguous United States. You can see the states that particularly had high temperatures, but the, the point is that we're seeing these uh, dramatic temperatures all over the planet. The 10 hottest years on record have occurred in the last 14 years, and the hottest year so far was the year 2005. Here's what the scientists are projecting into the future. Um, the next 20 years, uh, generally in the United States, about 17 to 19 of those 20 years are going to set new records for temperature, according to their projections. So we're headed into a much, a much warmer environment on this planet. Some of the things that are at play, and I should tell you that there are some tipping points in nature. You've probably heard about these tipping points. Uh, but we know that there are several tipping points that we need to pay attention to. One is the loss of snow mass and ice mass in the, uh, in the um, <clears throat> Arctic. And um, the Arctic is already contracting. Also notice that in the wintertime, this was the traditional pattern of snowfall. We, uh, in the red and, and also yellow lines, we're seeing less winter snows, and those that are, are coming are coming late and they're leaving earlier, uh, on an average of by two weeks per year on both sides. Here's what's happened in the North Pole. The red line is 1979. Uh, this is what we have today. The Arctic has, has contracted by 30%. This is the summer minimum, I should tell you. This is uh, what it looks like in the summertime, uh, at the end of the summer season. Uh, we're, we're seeing a contraction that's about 30% and about 40% by volume. So the Arctic has melted about 40% of its total ice. Uh, it's now uh, averaging about three foot in depth, so we're, we're seeing a, 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 an Arctic system that's shrinking. And uh, the, the key thing to remember is that the Arctic is a reflector, bouncing about 80% of the light that hits that Arctic ice mass back into the sky uh, where it does not heat the planet. When you melt the ice, the, the dark blue uh, ocean water absorbs about 80% of the energy. And so you replace a reflector with an absorber. So it allows that energy to accumulate. 
and to increase the overall temperatures on the planet. The scientists have been monitoring this very carefully, and just a year ago, were absolutely shark shocked when the Arctic itself developed a massive crack across the center, and, uh, and many scientists are predicting we'll soon have a, have a new passageway uh, for ships to travel. Sea ice extent, you can see what's happened. Uh, in the last 30 years, there's a rapid fall off on sea ice extent uh, in the northern hemisphere, and uh, that pattern uh, is continuing uh, to this day. The critical uh, melting of the Arctic uh, is also a factor in why the federal government recently uh, uh, started action on listing the polar bear as a threatened species. Because the polar bear lives on this, I took this photograph two years ago, this is the Arctic ice uh, in the summertime, that's what it looks like. Uh, the polar bears need that ice to uh, feed and to uh, uh, operate off of them, and as the ice shrinks, the, the, diff the distance between land and the ice becomes greater and greater. Last year was over 60 miles. Some of these polar bears had to swim 60 miles to get to land. And uh, so as a result, had reduced body weights, were having difficulty reproducing, and in some cases were actually drowning because they were running out of energy in their swims. The, um, the National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center has predicted that by the year 2040, there will not be ice in the Arctic in the, in the late summer period. So the late summer ice in the entire Arctic will be gone. And in its place will be open waters uh, that will be warming each year. So this is what they're predicting. Um, and th this is off of their website. This is the ice that we have today, or what we had at one time. And then you see 2040 uh, ice is gone from the Arctic. And with the ice goes the, the polar bear. Uh, this is the critical habitat for this, this animal. We have not uh, been able to uh, see any species lose its entire habitat without disappearing. One of the things that's happened, we've added about a one degree increase to our, our temperature in the planet. Uh, that sounds like a small amount, but actually as uh, this plays out, it's important to note that there's a differential that's playing out here. We get a lot of our weather as a result of the, the difference between the poles in the equator. And so as we warm up the poles, as, as the ice melts, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to see a dramatic increase in the temperature. In fact, we're already seeing that. If you spend time in Alaska or uh, northern Canada or elsewhere, you'll see that they've had a three to five, in some cases even a seven degree increase in temperature already. So as the temperatures across the planet go up, the differential between the poles and the equator, particularly the North Pole, uh, is going to shift quite dramatically. And that will alter our weather patterns and uh, w will influence uh, ocean currents as well. Oops. Rachel Carson, um, a great scientist, writer, uh, many of you know her as uh, the author of Silent Spring, the book on DDT. Rachel Carson wrote five books, and I think one of her finest books was The Sea Around Us. It was written the year that I was born, so those who are interested in figuring out my age can do the math. Um, Rachel uh, said in that book in 1950, in our own, time, own lifetimes, we are witnessing a startling alteration of climate. How did Rachel know that in 1950? She knew it because she saw wildlife and, and bird life moving and fisheries moving further north uh, each year, and she saw that pattern uh, occurring all over the planet. And so by listening to wildlife and by listening to the birds, Rachel was able to accurately predict that we were, in fact, warming the planet. And there's an entire chapter on that subject in her book in 1950. So she was paying attention to wildlife and listening to them and learned uh, something from them. We can learn, too, by listening to the polar bears today. You know, there's a, a, a great old Hebrew story in the Old Testament about Balaam. And it turns out that God had told Balaam not to go to this very dangerous place. And Balaam did not listen to God. And he head off with his, with his ass. And three separate times, his ass tried to get his attention because his ass knew that he was headed for trouble. Finally, the ass just sat down and started talking to Balaam, and Balaam listened to his ass. And the reason he did was, back in those days, there weren't that many talking asses as there are today. <laughs> <clears throat> but polar bears are speaking to us today, and we need to listen to their warning. They are getting, they're losing their weight, they're having trouble reproducing because their habitat's in danger. 
And they're not Republicans or Democrats. These are just everyday polar bears, and they, and they are a message to us all. The second warning I would give is that permafrost is melting. Why is that important? Well, it turns out that there's a massive amount of organic matter sitting under our frozen tundra and per permafrost around the world. And that um, massive amount of organic matter left from uh, many, many years ago has an enormous amount of carbon stored in it. Scientists predict that we can actually double the total amount of carbon in our atmosphere by releasing the carbon that's tied up in the permafrost. And so what you see here is, a, is an increase in the permafrost, um, the, the temperature of the permafrost over from 1950 to 1995. And I should say that it continues to go forward uh, in this particular chart. Uh, but there's a trillion tons of carbon dioxide sitting under the permafrost. And more alarming, there's 100 billion tons of methane sitting under the permafrost. And methane has about 23 times the heat trapping potential of carbon dioxide. I visited with the uh, University of uh, Alaska at uh, Fairbanks, and, and we went out and looked at, at uh, some of the permafrost. And each year, they monitor the depth of uh, melt in the permafrost, and they've been tracking this for years. And you'll see this chart on, on, the, on the bottom right here. The, the Russians have been doing the same thing. And in fact, for a number of years, Russian scientists have been calling out like voices in the wilderness, urging us to pay attention to what they're seeing in Russia. And uh, this is the, the, the permafrost in Russia, that photograph in the upper right, to show you what it looks like. But the Siberian tundra is now melting. And there's a young uh, postdoc uh, researcher by the name of Katie Walker. And she and a number of her colleagues uh, went over to Russia and, and uh, studied this phenomenon. And what they found out was that methane is now leaking out of those systems, as the Russians have been warning us, at five times the rate that the scientists had earlier predicted. So we're already seeing the methane begin to leak out of these, these incredible systems. I mean, we're talking about an area the size of Germany and France combined. And there's about 70 to 80 billion tons of methane. And these bubbles, I should tell you that that's a pair of gloves over here. And those bubbles are methane bubbles. And they're, and they're bubbling up through the permafrost. And as it melts in the summertime, they're released into the atmosphere. Uh, Katie, incidentally, just won a, a national award for her, re her research and um, has... has um, really led the way on, this, on this, uh, this study. That study, incidentally, did not get into the IPC report because the report had a cutoff date, and Katie's publication was the 7th of September. And the reason why I tell you that was something else happened on that same day. And the reason why you didn't hear about Katie's urgent report was that our media was all gathered around Boulder, Colorado. And if you remember, wind your clock back to what was going on. Now, John Benet Ramsey's supposed killer uh, was going to be indicted. And so 42 satellite trucks showed up in Boulder, Colorado to cover that story. Well, here's Katie releasing information saying that our planet is in serious trouble because the tundra is melting and it's releasing these massive quantities of, of methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. No one covered uh, Katie's work other than the scientific journals. And that's what's wrong with our, our, our media today. We're not getting the word out the way we need to. There's an urgency about these messages, and they're getting caught up in the, in the, in the frivolous uh, news coverage of, of our day. These are drunken trees. Uh, the permafrost, as it melts, um, causes these trees that were once rooted in, in frozen ground to be uh, a helter-skelter, and we're seeing more of that uh, all, over the, all over the tundra region. This happens to be in Alaska and uh, near the oil fields, and uh, you can see what's happened uh, on travel days. Uh, this is from 1970 to 2002, and look what's happened to the number of travel days. Uh, year by year, it continues to go down, and this is the result. Uh, we, we cannot travel but about uh, 70, 80 days today in the Russian, uh, or in the uh, Tundra region. The third warning that I would share, the third tipping point, the feedback, the positive feedback, however you want to describe it, are forest fires and forest diebacks, and scientists have been warning us about that, and they've They've called it the carbon bomb because there's so much carbon tied up in our forests. Well, what we're finding out is our forests are burning more often and, and the fires are larger than they've ever been. The Scripps study published in uh, July 2006 um, is one that I'll talk about. Here's a photograph I took of Alaska 
two years ago, flying over parts of Alaska, over four million acres of tundra burnt in Alaska because these, these systems are drying out and they're catching on fire. And we did not have this covered in our news because it only affects tribal people in Alaska. But it affects all of us, but our media is not covering these stories. There's been a fourfold increase in the number of forest fires, according to the Scripps study, and a sixfold increase in the amount of acreage burned uh, in, on the planet. Here's the fires that were burning in the summer of 2006. Notice that there aren't fires in, in, in Russia at this point because they came later in the summer. But you can see the, the forest fires that are burning. The Amazon has been in a three-year drought. And you can see the photograph in the lower left here is the Amazon burning. And you can see the Amazon burning in this image. Um, and it's a very dangerous thing because the Amazon has enormous amounts of carbon stored there. The Russians have seen a 3 to 7 per, uh, degree increase uh, in temperature. Uh, 29 million acres in Russia burnt last summer. Um, I come from Pennsylvania. My home state is that size. So imagine if the state of Pennsylvania burnt down, uh, that it would be in our news. But because it was in Russia, and it was all these scattered forest fires, our media doesn't cover uh, Russian forest fires, so we didn't hear about it. But they had enormous fires. These were huge fires, but this is what it looked like from satellites. Um, the Russians recognize that their, their forests are becoming much more flammable, and because there are important carbon sinks that are now burning up, we're releasing all that additional carbon from forest fires and also from forest dieback. This is a mountain pine beetle, and, you know, tonight is a cold evening, and people uh, probably would, uh, some people would say that maybe it's good that it's getting warmer, that we don't have to deal with all this cold. Well, the mountain uh, pine beetle is a good example why cold is good. The mountain pine beetle is a native species, and I, I'll show you this year by year. The green that you see there is uh, various pine species in the British Columbia region. And watch what happens uh, over time as British Columbia begins to warm up and the pine beetles winter over and also start uh, reproducing earlier in the season and, um, and begin to increase their populations. And I should tell you that this is not just true with the pine beetle. We're seeing a number of other insect species uh, around the planet as, as temperatures change, as the e ecological forces are being altered uh, through climate change. Look at those uh, infestations of, of pine beetle year by year. Uh, as, as the temperatures go up and, and fewer and fewer of these insects uh, are killed off in the wintertime, uh, enormous damage is done uh, to this region. And I believe there's some 14 million acres of, uh, of trees that died as a result of the uh, damage from the pine uh, beetles uh, in the British Columbia area alone. And there were also 4 million acres in, in, um, in Alaska that were killed. I, I actually flew over some of that. This is what it looks like uh, from the sky. You see a tremendous damage being done. And this is another close-up from National Geographic. Western pine beetle damage, uh, you'll see it all over the West now. You'll see increasing numbers of, of pines that are dying as a result of Western pine beetle. Also, I was struck uh, as I traveled across North Country to see the amount of damage to the aspen trees from the uh, leaf miners. These are insects that actually uh, get inside the leaf and, and mine the, uh, uh, the leaf itself and, uh, and kill it. The fourth major feedback that we need to pay attention to is the changes in ocean currents. And uh, what we're seeing, um, this is a, a, a representation of that. What we're seeing is as Greenland melts, and I'll talk more about what's happening to Greenland, but as Greenland melts, we're seeing more fresh water flowing into the uh, North Atlantic, and it's, it has the potential for altering uh, the, the Gulf Stream. The, the Gulf Stream actually operates by um, a thermal haline uh, pump. The, as the water uh, warms up and evaporates, it becomes saltier and the salt water is heavier. So as it gets north towards Greenland, it begins to sink. I should also tell you that the Gulf Stream influences tremendously the European climate. So the Europeans are very concerned about this and most of the research that's being done is actually being done by the Europeans uh, to understand what's going on with the uh, with the Gulf Stream. This was written uh, by Winston, uh, Sir Winston Churchill in, in uh, 1936, talking about the period of consequence, uh, the build up to the war and the threat to, to, to Europe as well as to England. And he says that we're, we're entering a period of consequences. 
And I would suggest to you that we too are entering a period of consequences. Uh, Katrina was a reminder of that, but we're seeing more intense storms and a lot of other changes in the world. Uh, let me back up here. Um, the Scripps Institute uh, looked at um, the ocean temperatures and projected that without human influence, this is what o ocean temperatures would look like. So this is the predicted natural variability in ocean temperature based on, on, on their research. They ran a model, uh, and this is what their variation shows as a result of human um, influence on oceans. And here is the actual uh, results of what they found as they looked at the actual temperatures of the ocean. Notice that humans are causing uh, the shift because, in fact, tracks the, the predicted model uh, that the Scripps Institute put together. And there's been several other models to look at this. I, I would tell you this, that 80% of the total energy being added to our planet is being added to the oceans. We're adding about two watts per square meter on the planet each year, and 80% and of the energy ultimately ends up in our oceans. But because we have so much water in our oceans, adding one degree of temperature is an enormous amount of energy. It's a staggering uh, 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 number to think about because it takes one BTU of, of uh, energy to get, raise one gallon one degree. You can imagine how many BTUs of energy are now stored in the oceans as a result of human influence. Thermal stress is, is a factor now in the de uh, decline of coral, and there's been several studies that are documenting this. Uh, this shows uh, thermal stress in the Caribbean Sea, and look what happens to the coral cover uh, from 1975 to 1995. Coral um, naturally looks like this. Look, look at all the wonderful fish in that system. Now this is what coral looks like in bleaching because of climate change. I should also mention to you that another big threat to coral and to fisheries is the buildup of acid in our oceans. About half a, a trillion tons of the carbon we put into the sky have actually ended up in the oceans and it ends up in the oceans as, as carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid is influencing the uptake of, of calcium uh, by fish and shellfish. So we've added an enormous amount of acid to the ocean. In fact, up until a couple years ago, scientists didn't believe it was possible to alter the pH of the ocean, but in fact, they're, they're finding out that that's no longer true. Hurricane intensity, uh, there are now uh, four uh, uh, well-received uh, scientific studies on hurricane intensity, and it was important to note that the last I IPCC uh, report and in fact endorsed uh, the research that's been done on ocean temperatures. The important thing to remember is that ocean, um, the ocean temperatures go up, the hurricane intensity and duration go up. So we're seeing as water temperatures go up, the wind velocity goes up, and storm, mo storm moisture content also goes up. So we're seeing more moisture in these systems as a result of the changes that are occurring. So we'll see greater intensity storms, these mega storms like Katrina, uh, as, as time plays out. And I'm sorry, this is a video clip. It's not playing tonight, so I'll move on. Um, while we saw a, a record number of um, hurricanes uh, last year, the Japanese had a record nine uh, hurricanes. We're seeing that same pattern all over the world. Uh, this past uh, summer, because of El Nino, we got a reprieve. But other parts of the world are seeing hurricanes and uh, I should also point out when you have storm intensity increases, uh, you end up with uh, uh, an increasing number of tornadoes. The research, I should say, is not completely solid on this, but the patterns uh, appear to be there and uh, more research needs to be done on this particular issue. The fifth dangerous feedback is rapid changes in ice formations around the world. Uh, obviously, Antarctica is uh, one of those places. Uh, Greenland is another place that I'd point you to. Uh, in 1992, Greenland was basically melting as much as it was depositing. Um, since that time, uh, in 2002, when they measured the outflow of water in Greenland, they found out that Greenland was adding a new Nile River to the ocean every year. So the volume of water flowing down the Nile River is now, was now being matched by, by Greenland. And the most recent uh, research published uh, in 2006 showed that 2005, tripled that amount of water. We're now um, putting three Nile rivers into the ocean from Greenland, which is about a cubic mile per week. And in fact, if you add up the melt of Greenland 
and Antarctica, we're putting about 90 cubic miles of fresh water into our oceans uh, every year. One of the interesting things that's happening, I, I think you can call it interesting, alarming things perhaps, is that as Greenland melts, the scientists were earlier uh, predicting it would be a rather steady melt and they were, uh, they were projecting numbers that uh, were frankly uh, uh, proven to be wrong. And one of the reasons that they're proving to be wrong is that the ice as it melts on Greenland, water is finding uh, channels down into the bottom of the ice in Greenland, creating these what they call mullins. And you'll see this tremendous flow of water going down underneath the ice. And if you know anything about drinks, you'll know that ice floats on water, whether it's an ice cube of a standard size refrigerator uh, or if it's a giant ice cube like a, a formation on, on Greenland. And what's happening now is the ice is actually being lifted up uh, and um, being raised up and the ice is moving on, on the continent of Greenland. And we're seeing a tremendous increase in the number of, of ice quakes. And ice quakes occur when these massive chunks of ice begin to move. And uh, you can see that there are two types of ice quakes, the non-glacial quakes and the glacial quakes. The gl glacial quakes uh, tend to occur more in the uh, summer months. But also notice what's happened year by year. The number of glacial quakes is on a rapid increase. Uh, over the last several years. In fact, I'm going to Greenland this summer with a, with a group uh, to meet with the scientists there to, to uh, learn more about what they're studying and, and understanding that system better. But from 1993 to 1999, the number of ice quakes has actually doubled. And when I say ice quakes, we're talking about ice quakes on the scale of 4.1 to 5.2 on the Richter scale. So these are significant quakes that are being picked up uh, around the world. Uh, again, it doubled in the last uh, few years, so we're seeing a double and then a redouble of the amount of ice quakes. One I chunk of ice got my attention. It was six cubic miles in size, and it slid 42 feet in under a minute. So we're seeing Greenland start to slough off massive chunks of ice uh, that will, in fact, alter the way the Greenland melts. And the scientists in the IPCC uh, report could not put a definitive number on the Greenland melt because they just didn't have enough data to, uh, to confirm their science. The uh, West Antarctica uh, Peninsula has had now several uh, massive chunks of ice break off all about the size of Rhode Island and you can see those, uh, those breakups here uh, is what they look like from satellite and uh, it's been quite dramatic. So we're, we're seeing uh, ice, uh, these massive ice formations break up in Antarctica and around the world. This is Brooks Range. I took this photograph flying over Brooks Range, but we're seeing that 98% of the high elevation glaciers are on the planet, regardless of where you go, are melting. And the melt is quite dramatic. And in fact, here's the, the, the mass balance on global glaciers. And you see the tremendous downward trend uh, on, um, on the ice volumes. And this is what it looks like. This is Kilimanjaro. These are the snows of Kilimanjaro. Look at 1970, 2000. And here's what they look like today. Within 10 years, there will not be snow on Kilimanjaro in the summertime. Here's Boulder Glacier at Glacier National Park. Within 25 years, scientists are suggesting there will be no, uh, no glaciers left in Glacier National Park. I guess we'll have to rename it Post-Glacier National Park. But you can see the massive melt of ice there that has occurred. And this is Portage Glacier in Alaska. And I could show you literally dozens of glaciers around the world. And, and, uh, that have exactly the same pattern. The Europeans have been experiencing uh, a tremendous warming and they're much more alert to this problem than we are. This is uh, a warming that occurred a few years back and uh, in 2003 they had a massive heat wave and most European cities do not have air conditioning and so the net result of the warming experience that they had was over 35,000 people that died during that, that heat spell. This past summer they had another one just like this except people had bought window air conditioners and there wasn't as many die-offs die as a result of that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing that struck my attention was young, one young college student was doing a reenactor at one of the castles and he was wearing a suit of armor. And it got so hot he couldn't wear a suit of armor anymore, so he took it off and he set it on the ground and, and instead he entertained his visitors by cooking eggs on the breastplate of, his, of a suit of armor. So that got the Brits' attention, that it was so hot that uh, the suit of armor, in fact, was, was cooking eggs. 
This is the rainfall data from Japan. That same pattern is occurring all over the world. It is a very dramatic change. And I have to tell you that the insurance industry has noticed that. And look at the losses that they're experiencing. And that's why they're pulling out of places like Louisiana and Florida and other places where these strong storms are building because they see the pattern, they see the trend. Their, their uh, actuarial uh, teams are, are calculating the risk and are finding that many places are, are gone beyond the point of, uh, of investment. And so you'll see more places around the world where insurance is no longer uh, an option. Sea level rise has already uh, increased on an average about 10 inches around the world. It varies depending on what part of the place, uh, planet you're on. Uh, but we're seeing, uh, again in the IPCC reports, increasing uh, sea level uh, projections as a result of global warming, as a result of the melting of Greenland and, and the expansion of the ocean water and as well as the melting of uh, the ice caps on mountains and, and uh, the melt of Antarctica. When you live at six feet above sea level, this, this is a thing that matters to you, and you're seeing the patterns. Again, uh, a lot of communities are uh, experiencing uh, terrible losses. If you look at Lake o Okeechobee, uh, the, all the Everglades and, and South Florida are very low elevation. Florida's an entire state, the highest point in Florida is 212 feet. So when you have sea level rise, places like Florida are going to get hammered. And you see what Sir David King, um, a science advisor from the UK, says, the maps of the world will have to be redrawn as a result of, and he's talking here, what's happening in Greenland. Ma number of major flood events by continent. This is Europe. This is Asia. These patterns are happening all over the world. This is uh, Mumbai, uh, India. They had a 37-inch rainfall in a 24-hour period. One of my friends was there. It was the most incredible thing he's ever experienced. Uh, and it just drove people into the, into the streets. It was absolutely unbelievable. And we're seeing that in Switzerland and, of course, uh, Sichuan province. Uh, there was recent floods again in uh, Asia this year. Uh, at the same time, there's also a, a drought occurring in other parts of the world. Some places are getting deluged by rain and severe storms, and other parts of the world are drying out. We're seeing that pattern uh, around the planet. Um, th there's places in Africa particularly that are drought stressed. And I, and I have to tell you that that the Africans are getting secondhand smoke. They are not a major contributor to global warming, and yet they're going to suffer uh, some of the worst consequences. Australia has had a thousand year drought, and uh, this past summer, this is their, one of their water supply reservoirs, and this is one of the researchers, but they call it the big dry. And uh, they, they are seeing and are mobilizing now because of the massive amount of forest fires and droughts and uh, failed ag agricultural production uh, all over Australia, and particularly in the, in the drier portions of the country. If we do everything right and control our emissions down to the level uh, that we need to, we will see a, a soil moisture reduction uh, that you see on this chart. And we're looking at approximately, unfortunately, the bar graph got distorted somehow on this image. But it, we're looking at about a 30% decline in soil moistures if we, if we uh, curb the bend the curve on the carbon dioxide emissions by about 2% per year for the next 40 years. And that's what we'll end up with. If we fail to do that, this is what we look at, a quadrupling of carbon dioxide as we release these massive stores of carbon and methane uh, under uh, these ice formations as well as the continued emissions that are projected for our planet. So we cannot experience a 40 to 60% uh, reduction in, in agricultural soil moisture well, I'm seeing a dramatic decline in productivity. This is uh, Lake Chad in uh, Darfur, and again, it's another one of these uh, images that's not going to run, but if you would track this, this is 1964. Today, that lake does not exist. It's one of the largest lakes uh, in Africa, and it's completely gone. And so Darfur is, is a, a drought-stressed environment, and people are starting to collide with one another, and we're seeing uh, uh, wars that are being triggered by uh, mass migrations of people because of drought. Uh, diseases are also moving on the planet as a result of changing climate, um, and we're seeing uh, shifts in seasons, as was mentioned earlier, and as a result of that, we're also seeing a spike in the number of invasive species that are moving into these vacated areas. A scientist recently calculated in order for ecological systems to stay uh, at, at the same uh, climatic place, they need to move northward 30 feet every day. So in order to stay even with where we are today, they need to move northward. Um, 
When I first came to National Wildlife Federation, just a month before I uh, applied for the job to return to the Federation, there was a study published by Dr. Um, Thomas and 17 other scientists that projects that we'll lose about 17 to 39 percent of the total species on the planet unless we change our course on global warming. And uh, to me, that was a, a very strong signal that National Wildlife Federation needed to make uh, global warming our number one priority. And I, I, I used that in my um, speech at the annual meeting, and someone made a cartoon out of it. Uh, and uh, that was probably the first media coverage we got on global warming for a while. But the important thing is, I, at that time, I was saying the gro global warming was the greatest story never told. Because our media, had, we had three IPCC reports that had been issued prior to that, and the media scarcely covered it. It was not making our, our news media the way it should have uh, been. This species of frog, incidentally, is a victim of global warming. It's now extinct or believed to be extinct. Um, sorry about that. Um, we're also seeing um, uh, invasive species in the ocean uh, moving to places where they haven't been. The Japanese are struggling with these, uh, these uh, uh, very large uh, jellyfish that have moved in uh, in places where they hadn't been before. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is that around the world there is increasing attention being given to where the United States stands on global warming. And the reason for it is that we contribute by far uh, the most uh, carbon per person. So there's not a person on the planet that outdoes uh, the United States. And so the world is asking us to do something about global warming. Uh, we're also, if you look at our country, we're also the leading country on the planet by far, uh, far exceeding uh, China. Uh, in India and other uh, countries. I should tell you that within 10 years, China will surpass us if we allow this to continue the way it's going, and uh, we will see uh, uh, great damage, as we talked about earlier. <coughs> Here's the good news. The good news is that there's still time to stop global warming. We can do this, but we need to commit to action today. And there are ways of doing this. This was um, two scientists, Dr. Sokolo and, and Pakala, put together these, what they call, wedges of reduction. And uh, we can um, cut our emissions by reducing end use, by increasing end use efficiency through things like changing light bulbs, by unplugging uh, appliances that are not being used, by getting more efficient refrigerators, and, and the whole list of things that we know that we can do to reduce our, our electricity end use. And uh, we can cut that much carbon uh, dioxide from the, the uh, emissions through electrical efficiency. Here's other end use efficiencies, including changing windows, insulating um, our homes, and doing a number of other things. Um, moving to a more efficient passenger car, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, again, it takes another wedge. So vehicle efficiency is important. Other transportation efficiencies, we ought to be reinvesting in mass transportation, particularly in urban areas, and uh, doing the things that we should have been doing for many years. Renewables, there's a great push for, for renewables in this country. That's another one of these wedges that can reduce our carbon because we're basically recycling carbon that's already in the atmosphere, not digging additional carbon from coal fields or, or pulling it from oil wells. Uh, and then uh, also uh, we can get uh, a reduction in carbon by storing carbon coming out of these new, if you, if you get them to build these new coal-fired power plants, you can actually take that carbon and store it underground, not with the old technology, but with new technology. And we think we can, we can get better uh, coal energy uh, by capture and storage of the carbon. So this is U.S. stabilization. We can cut our carbon emissions by 50% by doing these things. No new inventions, no new technology, using existing technology, applying that to our, to our future, uh, and we can cut our total emissions uh, in half. There's already a number of companies that are stepping up and a number of people are stepping up by installing solar, but much more needs to be done. We need a, a commitment uh, nationally to do that. Home Depot, incidentally, is selling uh, commercially available uh, solar panels, so if you're interested in a PV system, uh, go to Home Depot. Uh, also, windmills, uh, the tribal communities believe they have enough uh, wind on their lands to produce a third of our total electric needs by wind. I know here in uh, Kansas you are probably the third most uh, likely state to get uh, uh, vast uh, wind generators. We would like to see those located in places where they don't interfere with wildlife, where they don't damage important ecosystems. 
and with some careful planning, we can, we can have wind energy. Farmers can get another crop off of their fields, and we can avoid uh, the catastrophic, uh, catastrophic losses that we're talking about here tonight. Uh, automobiles are another important element to this uh, discussion. Um, let me show you some full, uh, fuel efficiency standards around the world. This is where J Japan is today, about 45 to 50 miles uh, per gallon. The EU is headed to above 50 miles per gallon requirement. Um, Australia is about uh, almost 35 miles per gallon requirement. Uh, here's Canada moving uh, well beyond 30. Here's the United States. We've actually gone backwards. We've actually reduced the, the efficiency of automobiles by about two, uh, two miles per gallon. Here's where China's at. We hear a lot of discussion about you know, China not doing its part. Well, we can't even sell our cars to China. What's that? The, the uh, California passed a, a new uh, fuel efficiency standard, and the, our federal government sued them to block them from implementing this because it was too severe on the auto industry. After all, California wants to achieve by 2016 what they're already achieving in China today. Uh, so we, we, we have a real struggle here, but it's important that we go after fuel efficiency in our automobiles. The French have invested uh, heavily in nuclear power. They're about 78% nuclear. Uh, but there are other ways of solving this problem. You can also buy carbon credits. This is a place where you can get some of that if you don't uh, have uh, ready, readily available uh, ways of doing that. Kyoto itself has been implemented, uh, is being implemented by a number of countries. There are two countries that did not sign Kyoto, that were not ratified by the United States and Australia. But every other developed country on the planet has, in fact, ratified Kyoto and is moving forward. The interesting thing about that is that the cities across this country have not sat by and let, uh, let the United States uh, uh, do nothing. And all these cities that I just put on the screen here have committed to a Kyoto uh, level uh, cutback, and we're seeing tremendous innovation across this country. I've, I spent some time with the mayors uh, at Sundance here a few weeks ago, and it's very exciting to hear the stories that they're telling about the things that they're doing in their own communities. I wanted to draw your attention to this point because it's, it's really important to realize we've been warned before about global warming. This is not something new. Read this statement. We are evaporating our coal mines into the air, adding so much carbon dioxide into the air as to change the transparency of the atmosphere. With each passing year, air must be uh, trapping more and more dark or infrared uh, rays, more and more earth light. Eventually, and this is the key word, the words, eventually this change might very well heat the planet to heights outside human experience. This was written by uh, Savante Arrhenius. And the reason why I share that with you, he, he published that in a scientific magazine in 1896. <coughs> this is not new stuff. What does it take for people to get connected to this issue? It's, it's very frustrating to, to know that we have, as a society, we've been so caught up in our televisions and uh, computers and, and handheld uh, games. The average young person today spends 46 hours a week in front of one of these screens and one of these devices. We are not paying attention to what's happening to our world because we're so captured by this artificial world that uh, we've become so much a part of. When people lead, the leaders will follow, and I believe that very sincerely. I'm seeing some very hopeful signs of movement building in this country where people are getting together to make a difference, to stand up, and to call for action. And I will assure you, when the American public stands up and demands action, our lawmakers will listen and they will move. But they will not do that until we demand change. This country has done some great things in our past, the, the, the great signing of the Declaration, the incredible uh, uh, battle that was in, uh, fought to, to liberate slaves. On and on we can go about the great things that we and our our forefathers and foremothers have done to stop uh, things that are wrong. And today, I I'm really excited about the number of campuses. There's over 900 campuses now involved in some form of climate action. And uh, National Wildlife Federation has involvement with that uh, community and is helping uh, to make change. One example, this particular uh, solar panel, uh, there's a, a building on Oberlin campus where they generate 30% more energy than they actually use. 
the, the building on campus is actually producing more energy by having uh, voltaic, uh, photovoltaic systems over their parking lot. And they were able to do this at a, in a way that actually saves the university uh, money, serves, saves the college money. Students are mobilizing in various campuses to get this sort of thing done, and I'm very proud and pleased to see that happening. <laughs> and uh, it's really exciting to know that, that uh, students are, are, are doing this. Uh, there's also a great chill out, and I, I want to uh, point to our website that has more information about that. And uh, there's also a, uh, an opportunity to become a, uh, a campus climate uh, champion and also to win a student fellowship. But a number of students are participating in this and it and again draws attention. On the 14th of April, uh, Bill McKibben, who wrote the book Death of Nature, a great guy, is, is organizing over 500 sites around the country. And in fact, is encouraged, he'd like to see 1,000 sites uh, by, the, by that date where people get together in their communities and again demand action. We want to see a 2% reduction in carbon for each of the next 40 years. And just think of it as a 2% carbon diet. Add your voice to the millions of threatened people. These are the Gwich'in people of Alaska. They are very worried about global warming and they need your help to protect their future. And I should tell you that there's a time frame when words still matter. And we're in that time frame when our words and our voices do matter. And let's act together to make that happen. There's a, there's a great verse in the book of Proverbs that says, a good person leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And I want to go to the values part of this conversation. We've talked a lot about the science and I've been aiming at your head. But let me speak to your heart because I believe that we have an obligation to our children. And there are many young people in this room and, and, and those of us who uh, are in the workaday world have an obligation to our children. And for me, that verse has a face and has hands and a legs. And it's my grandson Thaddeus. And I believe that I owe him a, a healthy planet. And I think all of us owe our own children and, and, our, and our future children a healthy planet. So let's work together to protect our planet. Because as you look at, at, the, at the great unknown, good planets are hard to find. And um, as a result of uh, sophisticated... Uh, camera equipment now uh, looking at various planets. We're seeing these planets close up and we're getting some very dramatic images of each of them. And we're, we're now understanding our solar system better than we did before. But what we've discovered is that our planet is unique. The Earth is unique. And we need to take care of it. It's the only planet that we have. Let me close uh, by saying a special thanks to Al Gore. And so this is where he gets all of his information. <laughs> He, he actually uh, asked to have that photograph taken. He was speaking at the National Wildlife Federation. He's got a great sense of humor. So, so, uh, but he, he's a walking encyclopedia of this issue. I'm just teasing about that. But uh, Al's, Al uh, gave a number of us. In fact, there's another uh, presenter here in the room, but he gave us many of these images. He's been doing uh, climate talks uh, since uh, 1988 when I first uh, met him. Um, and, and he's an example that one person can change the world. And in fact, he's been... Uh, working hard to do that, and so I'm very thankful to be a part of that. National Wildlife has helped Al train over a thousand uh, presenters across America, and we also train presenters in Australia. And uh, next month we're doing a training in um, in the UK to another hundred uh, uh, people who volunteered to learn about global warming so that they can make these presentations. So with that, I'll stop and open it up for questions and say thank you very much for uh, your time and attention. a question about, you were talking about changing the things we do, replacing our light bulbs, replacing our cars. What do you think is going to happen if we give up all that stuff? Like, what's going to happen to that stuff? Are we just replacing one problem with a new problem? And that sort of thing. You're talking about like a car? Yeah, like just about materialistic goods and, and things like that. We're, we're replacing it with something else, but is that really, I mean, what are we going to do with all that old stuff? And, you know, so. Well, there's, fortunately, the automobiles are almost uh, completely recycled today, so that's not a problem. Um, I think that as your car needs to be replaced, uh, the urgency is to buy a, a much more efficient vehicle. I would not go out and scrap a brand new car that you bought to, to go out and buy another brand new car. I think that'd be very destructive. But, but as you replace your vehicles, move to the more efficient vehicles. We're also asking 
that we get a cap, we, we put a cap on auto emissions um, and get a, um, um, a fuel efficiency standard established. Uh, and I was pleased to see the president actually call for a 20 percent uh, reduction in the amount of oil that we use in this country by uh, going after auto efficiency standards. And that's, uh, that's the first that that's happened. Uh, and we hope the House and Senate can uh, follow on and make that happen because that will give us a 2% reduction in, in uh, carbon emissions if we, if we take that step, 2% a year on the auto side. Uh, hi there, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Um, two questions for you. If there were to be a 50% reduction in emissions like as of tomorrow, how long would it take for us to actually see a reversal in the current trend? And then secondly, what will be the effects of agricultural production in the Americas and worldwide over the next like 10 or 15 years if we continue on the, cast, the path with that we're on? Uh, both very good questions. Um, one of the things about the system is that it takes, it has a certain inertia built into it, so we're going to see a continued uh, melt. In fact, the IPCC reports suggest 100 to 1,000 years of continued melt as a result of the uh, warming that we've already committed ourselves to. We're already committed to a, an additional degree of warming as a result of what we've already polluted. So if we shut the pipe off tomorrow, we would still see a warming. Um, but it's, um, the key thing is to keep it under 450 parts per million. Uh, we're now at 381 parts per million. I'm, I'm waiting to see what we admitted in 2006 because I have not seen the last numbers. They're going to come out soon. But in uh, 2005, we added about 2.6 parts per million to the entire atmosphere. And um, so you can do the math and figure out when we might hit that 450 if we don't slow it down. Uh, as far as agriculture, it depends on how, how responsible we are in curbing this uh, problem. But I, I, I know for uh, certain that certain parts of the world are going to see more stress on their agricultural systems, and in fact already are seeing those stresses. Australia's going through that, uh, Africa's experiencing some of that, and um, you know, there are other places around the world, South America, there's some places there as well. So the important thing is we need to move fast because we're, we're late. You know, back in the 80s when uh, there was Al Gore and others were calling for action, they were uh, called all sorts of names and, and, uh, and um, tree hugger and, you know, you know all, the, all the sort of uh, green bashing that went on during those years. And so we didn't take it seriously, but that's when we should have acted to completely stop any damage. Today we want to minimize damage, we want to reduce the, the threat, uh, but we're not going to be able to completely stop it. Uh, in the 30s, we had some very dry, hot summers in Kansas. Do you expect that to come back? Mm. You know, um, National Wildlife was actually founded on those very dry years that you're talking about. Uh, Ding Darling was a cartoonist from, uh, um, from uh, um, Iowa, uh, from Des Moines, Iowa, and he he saw very uh, vividly what, what those droughts were doing to wetlands and to waterfowl and was urging uh, appropriate action to avoid uh, problems. It, it's good, some places are going to be like that, I think, if we don't stop it. We're also going to see much more intense storms. Uh, in my home state of Pennsylvania, we get much hi higher intensity storms. We're getting about the same amount of rainfall that we had be previously, but they're coming in much stronger storm events and not in that slow drizzle that that recharged uh, your groundwater and allowed for uh, slow runoff and, and, um, and for adding to the soil moisture. What I'm worried about is you can get these intense storms that actually do soil damage. And, um, and, and that's unfortunately some of the patterns that we're seeing as a result of global warming. Other questions? Yeah, I heard on the news that the governor of Oregon is contemplating firing a skeptical climatologist. Uh, do you support such firing or censure of global warming skeptics? And two other quick questions. What are your personal feelings on the future of nuclear energy and ethanol? Okay. Uh, great questions. I, I think if someone is a genuine skeptic because they've got good science, I, I think they should be free to do uh, what they um, should do. There are some scientists, unfortunately, and I actually have a document. ExxonMobil has been funneling money through the Competitive Enterprise Inst Institute, and I have a document from the Competitive Enterprise Institute offering scientists who are willing to trash the IPC report $10,000.
And, uh, and some scientists who've gotten money from the Competitive Enterprise Institute are actually doing that. So I don't know about this particular scientist involved in Oregon, whether they are involved in some uh, arrangement with the Competitive Enterprise Institute or not. So I, I don't know for certain. I don't want to say anything about that because I just don't know anything about that particular incident. But I can tell you that there are skeptics that are being funded by ExxonMobil. And in fact, there's a powerful website that tracks all the skeptics and if you follow the money right back to Ex ExxonMobil. It's quite dramatic. Uh, there's actually a, a, a very part, and, and it's been passed around a bit, so you can track it down. If you do Exxon skeptics, you can find it. Um, the, um, the, the, the other question you had was, I, I lost it. Uh, the uh, oh, nuclear. And nuclear In 1978, um, uh, I was working with the Pennsylvania legislature, and we had this problem down about three miles, called Three Mile Island. And um, so I, during that accident, I was heavily involved in the, you know, from beginning to end and saw what happened when you put someone in charge of a power plant who was not competent and qualified, who actually cheated on his test with the help of the company. Uh, we, we melted TMI-2. It was a brand new unit. We melted it uh, down, and I think about 78% of the fuel rods were in the bottom of the reactor when it was all over. So I saw firsthand up close uh, that accident. I also served on the TMI uh, study commission afterwards to understand what we did wrong and, and try to learn how to stop it. Um, the, the thing about nuclear power is if we took away the subsidies, nuclear is not as competitive as wind and solar. Uh, nuclear is heavily subsidized, and I could go into the detail how it's, sub how it's subsidized. Um, there's also this issue of nuclear pr proliferation. Uh, some um, believe that that's no longer an issue because we've got, you know, because Iranians got nuclear uh, materials now in and, and North Korea and on and on, um, Pakistan, India, um, you know, it's, it's out there already. So uh, that's for a long time what held back uh, the Savannah River uh, plant and some other things to regenerate uh, the nuclear uh, waste and use it uh, in other power plants. Today we have 103 nuclear power plants in America. Most of them are over 30 years old. Most of them need to have uh, a complete rebuild soon because they're becoming embrittled as the, as the metals are exposed to radioactive material, it becomes embrittled. So we're going to have to replace those uh, reactors. Uh, Westinghouse Electric just signed an agreement to build four new nuclear power plants in China. So I think you're going to see some nuclear power, particularly for base stock, and we'll probably rebuild those 103 reactors uh, at some point, and we'll probably add a few more. But I don't see nuclear sweeping in to be the grand solution because uh, the costs primarily, and also waste, we've not solved the ultimate waste uh, disposal problem yet, but, uh, but it's certainly a factor. And you had a third question? Yeah. I, I think ethanol has an issues, has issues, and we have been, I'm on the Energy Future Coalition in Washington, we've been active on the 25 by 25. I would like to see us move to a switchgrass based, and, and it's going to take time to get there because we have, uh, we, we don't currently have the means to convert uh, um, cellulosic uh, ethanol is not there today, but it, when it does become available, it has great potential for doing some good things. But I also worry that we're connecting uh, the price of food with the price of fuel. And uh, we're currently, I don't know if you know this or not, but humans on the planet are currently taking in 50% of all the solar energy that's given to the planet in terms of our use of uh, plant material and animal uh, uh, um, meat from the planet. So we're, as one species, we're taking in 50% of the, of the annual uh, solar energy uh, applied to the planet, uh, which is quite dramatic. Um, but that's, that's an issue, and I, I think we need to work through that carefully. Uh, there's no perfect solution here, so we're going to have to be very careful how we proceed ahead. There's already, I understand, 125 new biofuel plants being built. You probably know more about that than I do because you see them here in the state. But we're building biofuel plants near where the corn is being grown. And uh, I hope at some point we'll be able to develop uh, the switchgrass. The good news about switchgrass is you can take switchgrass, and as I understand it, you can make um, sugars and then take the, uh, the spent protein and fiber and feed it to cattle. 60% of our corn has been going to cattle feed anyways. So you can take the spent switchgrass and feed it to cattle and get the same 
uh, protein benefit that you could from a, a field of corn for the same size. So if that's true, uh, we may be able to do uh, some of that, but it's, it's not the panacea that some have painted it to be. Other questions? Yes. Some of the carbon offsets are actually uh, connected to forest replantings, and it has to be uh, planting forests where they currently don't exist in order to get a carbon credit. If you're just replanting what you cut down, it, uh, it, it doesn't uh, help us. Uh, but there's a lot of work being done on that. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about it because it's hard to measure the total carbon. I think we need to do a lot more research to track uh, carbon in our forest system. Uh, and to make sure that those systems are being managed correctly so they're actually storing carbon. But I think there is an opportunity to grow forests and restore forests as a way to store carbon uh, back in the system. And obviously we need to stop uh, these tremendous forest fires uh, that are burning up uh, vast quantities of forest acres um, to help out as well. Other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>